Good day, everyone. On behalf of Acting Director Michael Costigan and Senior Policy Advisor David Lewis at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, let me welcome you to the Body Worn Camera Technical Assistance Webinar on overcoming what we call big brother concerns of officers and deputies regarding body worn cameras. My name is Chip Coldren. I'm the Director of the Center for Justice Research and Innovation at the CNA Institute for Public Research, the Director of Technical Assistance for the Bureau of Justice Assistance's Body Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program, and I will provide the introduction for today's webinar. Today's webinar focuses on a very important and, and long-standing issue for body-worn camera programs, how to understand and how to counteract the concerns that officers at different ranks and in different units have regarding the big brother possibilities of body-worn cameras. Officers wonder, can body-worn cameras and will body-worn cameras be used against them in an unfair manner? More on that from me later. We know that this is a legitimate concern not just the fear of a few officers. If not handled directly, upfront, and mindful of officers' stated concerns, a body-worn camera program will face considerable obstacles. So today's webinar will cover several topics related to the issue of officer and deputy concerns about the big brother effect of a body-worn camera program. It occurs to me, looking over the agenda for this webinar, that this topic is concerned with much more than how we implement body-worn camera programs in police and other agencies. It cuts to the heart of police culture. How a police agency accepts and accommodates a new technology or a new approach to anything depends in large part upon how the agency, the agency's leadership, the supervisors, and the staff and officers understand and accept change. This webinar will give us an important view into agency culture at different levels, and how an agency, or better yet, the person in the agency tasked with implementing a body-worn camera program, might think about agency culture and how the culture might influence how the body-worn camera project is received. The technical assistance team members and site representatives we will hear from today include Chief Harold Medlock, retired from the Fayetteville, North Carolina Police Department, and one of our body-worn camera training and technical assistance leads. Major Leanne Browning from the Atlanta Police Department. Major Browning began her career with the Atlanta Police Department in 1995 and worked her way up to commander of the Field Operations Division, where she oversees the Body and Worn Camera Program. We have Inspector Dan Isget from the Berkeley County, South Carolina Sheriff's Office. Dan began his career in 1985 with the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office, working his way up to commander of the Office of Professional Standards where he too oversees the implementation of body-worn cameras. Thanks to Harold, Leanne, and Dan for sharing their time and experiences with us and for working with us on putting this webinar together. Oh, and by the way, you'll hear from me for a few more minutes regarding some experiences I had at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department regarding the expansion of their body-worn camera program under the conditions of a rigorous scientific study. This is one in a series of webinars sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and coordinated by CNA for the Body Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. We thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for its investment in the Body Worn Camera Grant Program, in the Body Worn Camera Toolkit, and in a range of technical assistance resources and opportunities for agencies implementing body worn cameras. The Bureau supports state, county, local and tribal law enforcement agencies in many, many ways. We are grateful that they do. Now, please permit me just a few other comments. This webinar is recorded for the benefit of those who may view it later on our website. There will be opportunities for questions and participation at the close of the webinar. So please make your thoughts and questions known. I can assure you that others will appreciate hearing what you have to say. If you don't get a chance to voice your comments or questions, please use the chat utility to the right of your screen and we'll do our best to respond to your input. Following the webinar, you will receive a request to evaluate it. Please complete the evaluation and please give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. And please let us know what other topics you think we should cover on future webinars. Now let me also thank Bridget Bryson and Carrie Shelton at CNA who do the background work to make sure these webinars go smoothly. 
Now I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to Chief Medlock. Thank you, sir, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's safe and uh, sound today, and thanks for joining the uh, webinar. Now I want to share just an overview and some thoughts of uh, uh, why we're having this and why we call it the, uh, the big brother, the fear of big brother for our, our officers and deputies. And so I'm going to share some thoughts and, and some of my experiences uh, from implementing uh, as police chief in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the, uh, the body-worn camera program uh, that, that uh, we implemented there. And, and so some of the, the concerns and the issues that I face there are some that I continue to hear from uh, chiefs and sheriffs as we work with them on their body-worn camera grants and implementing their policies and uh, the new body-worn camera program. So just permit me a few comments, if you will. First, I'm going to tell you that uh, the chief and sheriff or sheriff should start talking about body-worn cameras to their deputies and officers now. Uh, if you're not, uh, if you've not implemented a program but you want to, uh, the best thing to do is start talking to them about it uh, uh, right now and, and talking to your community. Explain the benefits. I think many of the officers and deputies out uh, in, in our profession now have an expectation that uh, they should be equipped with them. And if they don't have that expectation, I think they also know that, that it's coming regardless. So start talking about it now. Discuss uh, the body-worn camera uh, technology and uh, also uh, uh, involve the officers or engage them in that, uh, in that discussion and, and research. You know, there's so many of us, in, and I'm speaking from a chief's perspective, there's so many chiefs and sheriffs that are really afraid to talk about implementing a new program or a new product technology in the department until they have the funding. And I, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, the more that we can share with our, uh, our departments, our offices, if you're a sheriff, that uh, this is something that's important uh, that we need to implement now. Uh, we'll find the funding or the funding will eventually find us. So start talking about it now. You know, I was uh, in Fayetteville, we were talking about uh, body-worn cameras to our officers and, and to our community two years before we, uh, we knew where the funding was uh, going to come from. And so in 2013, we identified the need. We started talking pretty uh, soon after that to our officers and explaining to them why we uh, thought it was important. And also some of our officers were engaged in that, uh, in that process too. Uh, and again, had no idea where the money or the funding was going to come from. And fortunately for us in, uh, in our city, we uh, were able to take advantage of the first uh, BJA Body Worn Camera Grant in 2015. So it wasn't a surprise to any of our folks or our community uh, that, that we were going to implement the uh, Body Worn Camera program. And, and you know, some of the things that you want to share with the officers, I think, is as you start to have these discussions at your shift briefings, your command staff meetings, uh, and your roll calls, or, or, or what the, the needs of the body-worn camera are. Why do we want to do this? And of course, we want to build trust of the community and, and uh, uh, build some transparency uh, into the operations that we do. And then, and then we want to talk about the benefits to the officers. And so frequently, uh, folks think that if they're caught on video or uh, video is shared, it's going to be bad. And more often than not, we all know this, that our officers and our deputies are out doing great work and great things every day. So documenting that work through the video, uh, using that as examples of good policing, uh, good sheriffing, I think is, uh, is very, very important to our officers. You know, one of the things that happened to us early on uh, was that our officers wanted to be very engaged in the technology that we selected. And so long before we uh, even began the T&E, uh, the test and evaluation phase, where we were asking vendors to uh, provide us with, uh, with product or with uh, technology to test and evaluate, the officers were doing their own research. And we encourage that. Uh, go to the websites, go to other departments, people you know there that have already implemented, find out what works and what doesn't. And so what we had then were uh, were officers in our department that were coming to us uh, with recommendations on product before we had ever tested and evaluated. Uh, and so, and then publicize that information to the department. It's really 
uh, great to see a young officer step up uh, in front of roll call or shift briefing and uh, say, hey, this is, uh, this is great technology that we've identified uh, and we're pushing the chief to, uh, uh, we're pushing the chief to uh, T&E it. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that, uh, that we uh, really keyed in on was identifying uh, the, uh, the young versus the veteran, um, you know, the superstars that, uh, that we could count on to do a good T&E for us. Uh, and provide some good uh, feedback. So we used both young officers, we used uh, veteran officers. I'm not gonna talk about the old guys, but we did. We used some old guys and old, old gals in our department that uh, uh, were able to provide their perspective after having spent years on the street. And then the other thing that we did were, uh, was to, to identify those folks that provide a very positive outlook on uh, the Body One camera uh, technology, and then those that uh, we identified that might be resistant. And, and that really uh, went a long way in helping us to, uh, to, to, to develop buy-in. You know, a couple of things that will happen as, uh, as you move through a, a test and evaluation phase, and I'll share one quick story with you. One was um, that we had an officer that was uh, testing some equipment for us, uh, was on the fence for you know, whether we should have body-worn cameras or not in the department. A uh, good officer took a call one afternoon at a, a grocery store where a, uh, a female had concealed um, uh, some steaks uh, under her shirt. And so the officer responds and uh, the, uh, all he wanted to do was write the woman a ticket for shoplifting because it was a, it was a relatively low uh, dollar amount of uh, items that were stolen asked her to remove the, uh, the items from her shirt. She did. Uh, he never laid his hands on her and then uh, wrote her the ticket, sent her on the way. Following that, uh, the next week, we received a call from the woman's attorney uh, who requested an audience with our internal affairs to make a complaint that the officer had sexually assaulted her. Uh, so we, we certainly invited them in to make that, uh, that complaint. Uh, we were able to show them, uh, at that point, we showed them the video of the encounter. And after we showed them the encounter, uh, the attorney stood up, shook my internal affairs commander's hand, apologized for wasting our time, and, and did all he could but drag her out of, the, uh, out of the police department that day. That was a huge selling point for us. That was what I call a save. And it really started to increase the interest in, hey, this is a good product, a good technology for us to... Uh, to make sure that uh, the people are, our people are safe and protected. The other one I want to share with you is that as we presented the body worn cameras uh, to our communities, we spent a lot of time, uh, and I did spend a lot of time in front of our community groups explaining the technology and the need for it. And so we would bring in one of our officers who was doing the T and E uh, to show them actually how it fits on the uniform and what it looks like. And one of the things that we did uh, early on in the process was have, uh, we explained that the body worn camera video wouldn't look like uh, uh, an episode of Cops. It would be somewhat jerky. And uh, so we uh, had the officer and I, we would kind of lay hands on each other and kind of rock each other back and forth. Um, and then we would show the video and show what it looked like. Well, I had a young officer one evening that, uh, that did that. I put my hands on him and I thought the guy was gonna take me to the ground. And uh, of course, the community got a great laugh out of it. My commanders that were there and supervisors got a great laugh out of it. And the next day I had 15 volunteers to be T&E uh, to the community uh, so that they could lay hands on the chief. Uh, but, but again, those are the kinds of things that promote the interest and the excitement in Body One Camera. I think, uh, so, so publicize the success stories that you have during uh, your test and evaluation phase. Don't be afraid to get out in front of that. Uh, and, and, and really encourage your officers to share those saves uh, as they're doing the T&E. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the biggest concern that I hear and, and did hear as we uh, implemented uh, was the concern from officers of what I call fishing uh, here in the South. We, uh, we had a great concern that our uh, officers uh, feared that our commanders and our supervisors would be fishing for uh, improprieties and specifically, well, I'm just gonna be written up for using bad language uh, if you catch it on video. Well, our, res our response to that was number one, we don't want you using 
foul language or, or bad language in public anyway when you're dealing with the public. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, you know what the expectation is, and it's against our policy already. But the second thing is we were very clear in our temporary or our draft policy that our supervisors would not use their reviews of uh, the body-worn camera footage to simply foot fish or to, uh, to target or focus on a particular officer. And that really, again, starts to uh, eliminate the fear of uh, officers. And, and really, it's what's acceptable for your department. Um, you know, I had a conversation with a uh, police executive uh, about two weeks ago, and, and he said that uh, one of his officers uh, received a complaint for uh, rudeness. And so, of course, they pulled the body-worn camera up. And on the video, uh, the officer is depicted using the F-bomb or a derivative of the F-bomb, I'll let you use your own imagination to that, 27 times in, nine sec in, in 90 seconds. And he wanted to know my opinion of that. And I said, well, first, I didn't know that you could use it that many times in 90 seconds, but clearly if that is an unaccepted practice in your department, it's not the body-worn camera that caused the problem, it's the officer that, uh, uh, that caused the problem. So through this entire process to eliminate the fear of Big Brother and to encourage the officers to, to be excited about it, we use this phrase, catch our officers doing something right, not catch them doing something wrong. Uh, those complaints and those issues will come and, uh, and of course the body one camera uh, video will either quit the officer or clear them of the officer or clear them of the charge or it will help document more accurately what happened. And I. I would also encourage that even those things that were uh, less than stellar that uh, came, have come to light uh, through my department and our use of body-worn camera, we were able to, uh, to work with the officer in most cases to uh, retrain them uh, along with discipline, but also encourage them to share their experience with their fellow officers to, uh, to help them understand exactly how the department will use uh, the body worn camera. Just some thoughts from from my perspective of uh, my my personal experience, professional experience, and then uh, as I work through the body worn camera uh, TTA. Uh, Dr. Colder, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Harold. Um, appreciate you sharing sharing that information and your experiences with us. So, as background to my comments about the lessons we learned in Las Vegas. We at CNA conducted a multi-year experimental study with body-worn cameras in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department beginning in about 2014, and we learned some important lessons. So please bear with me for a few minutes as I recount them. First, public sentiment matters. At least it certainly mattered in Las Vegas, where the sheriff was under intense press and public scrutiny regarding the use of force and civilian shootings by deputies. At the suggestion of CNA, Las Vegas Metro implemented body-worn cameras, at first as a pilot program. Once that happened, we at CNA, in cooperation with Las Vegas Metro, applied for funding from the National Institute of Justice to study the impact of body-worn cameras on use of force, complaints, and several other outcomes. The funding from NIJ was approved, but we needed several conditions to hold steady as we conducted our research. First, we needed the cameras to be implemented in an orderly fashion so we could maintain the conditions of a randomized experimental design. This proved very difficult, as the Las Vegas community was demanding that all cameras be distributed immediately, which would have violated and negated our study design. Thankfully, the sheriff was able to convince the community of the importance of the study. Still, community sentiment matters a lot regarding how body-worn camera programs are perceived and accepted. Second, and I believe our presenters will support me on this, it matters a lot where the body worn camera program is located within the organization. When our study began in Las Vegas, according to the collective bargaining agreement in place, leadership could not mandate deputies to wear body worn cameras. We had to depend on volunteers and we needed about 400 volunteers out of about 1100 deputies. Now, what do you think the rate of volunteerism was when the body-worn camera was initially located in the Internal Affairs Unit? You guessed it, almost zero. Our study would have failed under those conditions. 
Thankfully, Las Vegas Metro moved the body worn camera program out from under internal affairs. And importantly, as Chief Medlock just discussed, modified its policy to disallow supervisors from using body worn cameras as fishing expeditions for violations of officers wearing cameras. I'm sure you can see the issue here. An officer wearing a body worn camera during a pilot study, when his or her fellow officers not included in the study, would not be subject to the same level of review and surveillance, would be at a greater and at an unfair risk of being found to violate department policy, in addition to being at risk of violating a new body-worn camera policy. So, when Las Vegas Metro moved the body-worn camera out from under internal affairs and revised its policy to prevent supervisor fishing expeditions, interest in body-worn cameras and in, re and in the research project advanced significantly. So two things I want to impart here. Number one, community sentiment matters greatly in the, in the introduction of body-worn cameras. And number two, more to the point of today's webinar, where the body-worn camera program is placed within the department can make a very big difference. Both of these issues, and of course a host of others, matter greatly when you implement a body-worn camera program. Now let's hear from Major Browning. Good afternoon, and thank you for, for having me. And on behalf of Chief Shields and the Atlanta Police Department, I am, I am very excited to be here. Um, just a little bit of background on me. I do have 25 years and some change with the Atlanta Police Department. I've worked in patrol criminal investigations, um, commander over special victims unit, and captain over major crimes. Um, but I also was a... Um, the commander over our Video Integration Center. And the Video Integration Center, or VIC, consisted of a platform that ingested both public and private sector cameras. We have about 10,000 cameras that, are, uh, that we are able to view. So uh, with that, I mean, you can't get uh, more big brother than that. During my tenure at that unit, um, I was also tasked with starting the research and field testing of body-worn cameras. So with that background, I want to stress that the, the key to, to my, or the theme um, to my presentation um, in mitigating the Big Brother effect is you, you've got to have officer involvement um, from the research and development uh, phase uh, into implementation. So a lot of comments do fall in line with Chief Medlock's, but from our perspective, we began um, a year and a half uh, research and field testing on body-worn cameras. Um, it was out of the Video Integration Center, and we tested um, all different types of devices in a few different settings. So we had patrol officers uh, do some testing. We had specialized units uh, do some testing. We surveyed the officers. We, want, we wanted to know what they felt their, the ease of which device had an ease of use. Um, for the supervisors, which, which device, uh, which company had the best back-end office, um, which how do you categorize it, uh, place the case numbers, search, search for video. Um, and again, back to the officers, we wanted to know um, the wearability, uh, is it snug, do they fall off when they run, and that sort of thing. So this was a crucial piece in getting their um, input um, because it gave the officers a sense of ownership because we really took what they said to heart, and that is how we chose which body-worn camera uh, we, that we went with. From the research and field testing, uh, we developed our, our policy, and we got a work group together to do this. We wanted development from all different perspectives. So we had uh, members from the law department, our training academy, um, Office of Professional Standards, Field Operations Division, to even include um, our Criminal Investigations Division. Uh, we wanted all of them to have a say in how we uh, developed this policy. Uh, so we took best practices at, at that point in, in the Body One Camera history, was minimal at the time, but the best practices that we did find 
Uh, we tailored them to our operational standards, and we made sure that our policy was a living document because of the rate of, of change with the technology, the bettering of technology, and then case law to follow. We wanted to make sure that our SOP was on a six-month review. So initially, when we, when we put this out, we did not have any auditing process processes in our SOP, but as, as I will say later, um, we, that became an absolute necessity. So after policy development, we developed training for officers uh, and then also our internal and external partners. So the courts, the city government, we had a lesson plan for each of those, and, and it really functioned as an, an introduction to the body-worn camera um, and then answered a lot of questions for them. Uh, we used uh, another lesson plan for the Civilian Review Board, um, then members of the community. We held town hall meetings in which we had officers come in with the device show video of what it looks like, very similar to what Chief Medlock did. Um, and that was hugely important to get um, the buy-in from the community. Um, and they backed us absolutely 100%. Uh, so once uh, those, the training was developed, we held mass training for our um, officers. And we rolled out our cameras um, in a phased approach. Uh, so, we, our high crime areas, our high crime zones were the first to receive uh, the body-worn camera, uh, as well as our tactical narcotics squad. Uh, so they had the, the cameras first. So any questions as when other um, zones were, were getting their body-worn camera, those questions were aired out when they received their mass uh, training. So we were able to prepare those, those questions and, and have them uh, ready as it phased, um, as they phased out uh, throughout the entire department. So that, that brings us to, we were able to get all of our 911, all of our officers answering 911 calls were outfitted with uh, the body-worn camera. But in 2018, Chief Shields um, wanted to have an understanding of how we were activating our body-worn cameras because our SOP said that you will turn it on for any calls for service. Um, but she really wanted to see uh, through an audit um, where we were percentage-wise uh, for calls for service and having video with, with that calls for service. So we had city auditors come and, and do an audit uh, of a, a, a section of time, and what it found is that we were at a 66% com, uh, percent compliance rate with turning that, the cameras on as opposed to calls for service. So. At that point, she developed a, she wanted the body-worn camera uh, unit to be out of our field operations division. And so she developed that unit of operation, which fell under um, FOD. Uh, and at that same time that that was occurring, we were having the Super Bowl, and then also we had, um, we missed two critical incidences where uh, they were both officer-involved shootings, and the one that happened in March of 2019 is really a catalyst for the change that we, we then had put in place. So the, the March incident was a, an officer uh, working the graveyard shift. He was flagged down, and uh, the victim stated that he was just robbed by an individual and the individual just happened to be walking up the street. So things developed rapidly. The officer jumped out of his vehicle, uh, gave chase into the woods, and unfortunately the, the perpetrator uh, turned a gun on the officer and the officer shot and, and killed the individual. 
Uh, unfortunately, none of that was caught on his on his body worn camera, so uh, that caused um, caused issues because it made it the general consensus was that I mean, that it appeared that we were hiding hiding something. So that transparency is what we lacked in that in that critical incident. So with that, um, the chief wanted to uh, institute activation audits uh, that the supervisors have to do. So what we did was through our SOP, we made sure that uh, supervisors are auditing their, uh, uh, their units of operation, the personnel, uh, at least five officers per week. They have to um, they have to audit, they have to look at their calls for service, and then they have to go back in and make sure that they have video that corresponds to that calls for service. So that was a huge change, um, and it definitely made put the onus on the supervisors and the officers to ensure that uh, they activate their body-worn camera. And with that, hand-in-hand hand was, for us, a change in disciplinary action. For years, we had asked the officers, please turn your cameras on, please turn them on, but we never had anything in place that really had teeth to ensure compliance. So uh, the chief um, imposed a, a pretty a strict disciplinary action, and so the body-worn camera unit started auditing our auditors, our supervisors, and ensuring that they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and you know, we did catch a few, we, we caught a lot, I should say. We caught a lot of officers who, who needed to um, ensure that they were in compliance, and so they received some, some pretty stiff disciplinary action. And at first, it was not taken well. That's when the, the big brother complex really kind of hit home. But once we started sitting down with those officers and explaining to them that this device is, is like your sergeant, your, your silent partner. So in that disciplinary process, we wanted to make sure that they understood that what this device is for us is, is a transparency. Um, that even if you have calls for service of illegally parked cars or um, gunshots in the area, that those, those calls have to be documented with, with the video. There's, there's all there is to it. And when I had a chance to, to sit down with these officers, I explained to them when I was in the field that in community meetings, I didn't get beat up for uh, the, the big stuff, the carjackings that was occurring um, or, or shootings in the area, what I got beat up for was the, off, the, the citizens calling and them saying that an officer never showed up on the, on the scene and explaining to the officers how important it is to be able to say, the officer was there, would you like to see the video of your call? Um, that helps tremendously. So we took those times, those, that, those disciplinary action uh, meetings, uh, to really hammer home the importance of, of why we're doing, because they, they heard the why in the mass training. But once you get out back on the street and you, and you have this device and it becomes a, a, a way of, of being at this point, you forget the why. So we definitely wanted to give them the why again um, and for the most part, I would say 95% of the time, the officer would walk out there with a renewed sense of understanding and appreciation for, for what the body-worn camera can, can aid with instead of getting in trouble for. So with that, we definitely had a, a, a change of, of mindset with our officers and what helped with that is our Office of Professional Standards started emailing officers of complaints that came in on the officers and the investigators had body-worn camera that showed that 
the complaint was, was not legitimate whatsoever. So those investigators would then turn around, send an email straight to the officers, copying their chain of command, and letting them know that, hey, good job of having, this, having the camera on at the time that you needed to have it on. And that, in and of itself, has been uh, a huge help for us as we move forward in this arena of, of having to video absolutely everything. So in summary, uh, with the audits, the biweekly bi reviews that we do, um, the emails sent from our internal affairs and, and our strict disciplinary action, I think that has, has really helped um, an acceptance and an understanding that no, it's not, it's not Big Brother. If you, if you cuss, you're not going to get in trouble for that. That's not what we're looking for, um, that this device is, is actually your silent partner and uh, can help you more than it, than it gets you in trouble. So from Atlanta, that's, that's where we stand uh, at this point. Major, thanks so much. Great information. We really appreciate that. Commander Esgett, we'll turn it over to you now, sir. Thank you. On behalf of Sheriff Dwayne Lewis and Berkeley County Sheriff's Office, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. Um, I'd like to give a little background on uh, my agency and where we came from when we went into the body-worn camera process. Um, we have 203 sworn deputies, and in 2015, we had an election, a special election, and they had the first new sheriff in 20 years. And when the new sheriff got here, there were only 10 in-car cameras and there were no body-worn cameras. So our agency wasn't used to any kind of video um, recordings. Surrounding agencies had in-car cameras in their operational vehicles for the past 15 years. So we were kind of one of the last ones to the party. So the our surrounding community and our community knew all about body-worn cameras and video cameras. But by 2017, over half of the sworn deputies that we had hired from other agencies, they came from uh, agencies that had in-car cameras or body-worn cameras, and all of them had different policies and different cultures that we had to deal with. Culture is such a, such a big factor in this, and it's going to play uh, a big role into this whole big brother idea. Your officers are aware of the culture before they, before the body of worn cameras, before you get them. They know if your agency is aggressively looking for reasons to discipline people, and if you have one of these agencies, it's going to be difficult or more difficult to ease their fears regarding the body worn cameras. But if your officers believe your can command staff is fair with its officers, then it'll be a lot easier with this. Um, bringing on the body-worn cameras. But because many deputies were from prior agencies that believed that they could discipline their way to a successful agency, those um, officers were very cautious about the use of body-worn cameras. So it's important for the senior command to relay, re relay this information to the line supervisors, the purpose and goals of the body-worn cameras, because those are the ones that have huge influence on the officers that are going to be wearing them day to day. Now, our in-car camera and body-worn camera unit um, reports directly to our CGIS compliance officer, and he's also the agency's IT guy, and he reports directly to the sheriff. So this in no way um, comes through the officer's professional standards. We were involved because it was a, the federal grant that we received, and we were monitoring the grant pro process, but other than that, the officer pro professional standards was never involved um, in this, and if any issues came up, it was the uh, CGIS compliance officer that briefed the division majors of any issues. Tagging and activation, and that's one of the biggest problems, and especially because we had an agency that just didn't have a lot of in-car cameras, so a lot of these officers just weren't aware or with using um, in-car cameras or body-worn cameras in the tagging system. And we experienced a problem at the beginning with secretary units and sergeants were not activating their cameras thinking that only the primary unit needed to. But it's so important that everyone um, who's involved in the scene have their body-worn cameras because it's your point of view, that particular point of view, that would be critical sometimes. And we found that the supervisors were not conducting 
um, reviews. They review the body worn camera footage for use of force, complaints, pursuits, but we're not taking the time to ram randomly check the body worn camera footage. And this um, this really helps identify some of the issues that um, you can help these officers with, with especially officer safety issues. Now, the, what we did to improve the buy-in. Well, the deputies who tested them, we chose ones that were highly respected by their peers and had a positive attitude. And these deputies and supervisors engaged in the policy draft for real-world input. So we, we constantly, when we were putting the policy together, dealt with the deputies that were actually using them and the supervisors involved with using them and other deputies within the agency to let them look at our policy and give us a real real world input of what how what would really happen how this would go and why we'd need this and maybe not need that. And also um, when we provided training we provided um, some positive aspects during the initial training. So we brought um, everyone together uh, after three months and uh, had a meeting to discuss some issues that we have, but also, real importantly, um, we showed them video clips um, of incidents such as an officer involved shooting, uh, domestic violence evidence, drug evidence, um, how this enhanced um, the, our, our agency and our goals. With our officer involved shooting, um, this was right after we got the body worn cameras installed, maybe a month. Um, the officer seen exiting out of the car. You could see the the, the suspect's uh, the driver's door open up and the muzzle flash from the gun before our deputies returned fire. Now, we had had some officer-involved shootings before. We had body-worn cameras, and I dealt with the, our state law enforcement division a lot with these, and as soon as they saw that, that video, you could tell in their mind but they said, this, this investigation is over with. We just need to write it up. So um, that helped out a, a lot of, um, with, uh, with our guys. Um, during complaints and eye investigations, um, the deputies were explaining how the videos exonerated them. In the past, there were many complaints that, at best, we could not sustain. But we couldn't exonerate them because it was the deputy's word and the complainant's word. And we explained to them, now that you got a body-worn camera, we can actually exonerate you because we've looked at the body-worn camera, and the body-worn camera shows that you didn't do what they said. And also, I think it was mentioned earlier about the why, is explaining to the deputies of why we're doing these things is so important to them and it's so important to the buy-in. We've had a lot of successes, like I said, with the officer-involved shooting, but we had a, a a couple of high profile cases in which our deputies were exonerated for use of force. It was all over the all over the uh, Facebook and then um, once that um, these body worn cameras footage was discussed with the complainants um, and interested groups, um, it just it just went away, which which was absolutely great. Um, we we had a video of a deputy talking a suicidal person off a bridge which went viral over the internet. We placed it on our Facebook page, and we also, within a short period of time of that, had a deputy saving an infant's life that was captured on a body-worn camera, and that was also um, heavily covered on social media and the news. And we also made sure that, you know, because of some of these reviews that where we did catch them doing the right thing, that they received rewards and accommodations. We're really involved in our community, and it's it's so important to get um, the buy-in for the community. The new sheriff set up a citizen advisory board and assigned a deputy to each one that is is from the area. Um, and he presented the. We went around to all these uh, community places and and presented the plan and told them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and even if, even if these agencies knew because the surrounding communities. What was going on? We wanted to explain that how important transparency is to us. So <clears throat> we went from <laughs> zero almost of any video to 100% a very short period of time with a lot of different uh, officers from different agencies. And through the process that we went through, 
we've really uh, have not had much issues with deputies and having uh, negative connotations to it. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, great information. We appreciate uh, you sharing that with us. Um, we have a few minutes and a couple of questions have come in. So, uh, Major and, and Inspector, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw a couple at you. Uh, one of the questions for uh, Atlanta PD was how many revisions of your policy or improvements of your, of your policy have occurred since you implemented Body One Camera? At least 10 iterations of, of our SOP. So, again, something new happens at least every other month that we have to go, okay, we need, to, we need another draft. So um, that's why it is an absolute living document. Awesome, thank you. And, and, and another question has just popped up. Uh, how many, uh, and this goes to the, uh, the calls for service versus activation, um, what, uh, what type of discipline was generally administered for, for violations and did, did you have a, a first, I call it a first, second, and third offense, or that's what the uh, question does. So uh, what did that look like for your officers? And then how long did it take? I think finally, this is for me, how long did it take uh, to, to really overcome that, uh, that time or those, uh, those problems? That's a great question. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Um, so our first offense was a four to 16 day uh, suspension. Uh, if you were caught again on the second time, it's a 16-day to possible termination. Uh, so it was it was extremely stiff and and got the attention of of our officers. So when we first initiated it, we we were given some leeway, and I say we as the disciplinary authorities were were given some some leeway, um, and. What what I would do is if somebody got caught on a on a first one uh, first instance, they were up for four days. Um, when I would have a, the disciplinary uh, meeting with them, they would give me their side of the story. And and nine times out of ten, I mean there was some some valid points that they they did uh, bring up. And I had the leeway to bring that discipline back down. So when they understood that they were up for four days, but then walked out of there with a day or two days, they felt a whole lot better about it. But with that, um, I said, you know, please, please just be our, our spokesperson. Because again, we are not, we are trying to change the culture of our department. Um, it's not about absolutely just gigging people to be gigging people. This is, this is about change of culture. So um, if you could be our mouthpiece uh, or, and, and, uh, and help other officers understand that, and if they have any questions, they're always free to, to come up and see me. So that's how we, we handled that. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Inspector Isgood, I have one that just popped up. Um, you shared early on that uh, your your deputies brought into the the department from other agencies uh, uh, some experience with both NCAR and, and somebody one camera um, experience. So how how did that um, how did that help you or or did it hinder you in your uh, in your deployment? Well, it kind of did both. Um, it helped with these officers so. Um, and it depends on what agency they came from, whether there was a lot of success and whether it was done the right way, um, those officers could relay on to the, to the officers who had no experience with, a, with, with what a real life experience is with this. Um, and it also helped that if you've, if you've used uh, in-car camera for a while or a body-worn camera for a while, you really get to know how to tag it, how to do all the technical things you need to do with it. Um, and they were able to help the other officers that had no experience with it before. So by and large, it was a positive experience um, for us. Great, thank you. Uh, and then Dan, finally, um, you, you talked a little bit about those that uh, were involved in the, uh, sele the um, uh, testing of uh, Body One Camera. Were you pretty intentional on how you went about that, uh, those, those deputies that did T&E? 
and then were they involved, the second part of that question coming in is, uh, were they involved in demonstrations of the, uh, of the technology to, uh, to community groups with your share? Uh, yes, um, we were uh, very particular at who we did the testing. I think that's, uh, that could be a deal breaker if you get the wrong person who's not interested <laughs> in it. But, um, it and, and, it's, and it's important that it's somebody that their peers look up to because they're going to listen to um, and take a great deal of stock into what this person says and also where they were in uh, what district or zone assignment they were working was important so we made sure that we put this officer in a zone where he would get a lot of calls so there would be a lot of video footage and also he, that person would go and um, participate with community meetings to be able to answer questions about it. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, Major Browning and uh, Inspector Isgett, we really appreciate it. I'm, uh, your, your presentation and your, uh, your uh, patience with the questions. And Dr. Coldren, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Chief, and thank you very much to our presenters. Um, as I said earlier, I very much appreciate the time that everybody took to put this webinar together and the thought that they put into their presentations. Let me also once again thank David Lewis from the Bureau of Justice Assistance for his support for all this work. And thanks to everybody for joining in. I look forward to having you join us for the next webinar.